All right, everybody. Um, welcome to Infinite Possibilities. We're going to talk neurodivergence in the beer industry. My name is Tony Tupint. I'm the owner and co-founder of Black and Soul, and this is my sister, Rin. And I will let her tell you who she is and what she does. <laughs> uh, I'm a troublemaker in Canada land, <laughs> and I talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. Uh, especially in alcohol, but I am starting to branch out quite a bit, but that is kind of the main crux of what I do. Yeah, and Bryn's an awesome friend and excellent confidant and somebody I know I can call if I'm losing my shit or if I'm feeling, you know, emotional dysregulation at any time. She's somebody that's really patient and willing to hear you out, which makes her good at the, these jobs she's telling you that she does. Um, so yeah, Ren, um, tell us about how you came to understand your neurotype and how you were neurologically divergent. Uh, so nine, 10 years ago, I, um, actually, let me, let me back it out a bit. So I think about five to 12, 13 years ago, I got diagnosed with ADD and at the time was told no matter what happens, don't let them medicate you. So I have the diagnosis. I have no medication. Uh, and a lot of people are like, are you sure you have it? And I'm like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot. I've had it. I, I've also had it double checked. So I'm, you know, I'm back in therapy and therapy is great. Um, but my therapist was like, okay, talk to me about it. And, and we went through it and she was like, yeah, 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 that's it. Um, and I think that we, you know, we always joke about it. There's always that, like, you know, people would say, oh, I'm ADD. I've got like the attention span of a squirrel or I'm like super OCD. Uh, we got to stop doing that because I think that that was also part of why I didn't go and really get it checked out yeah. because there's that notion of like, sure. You know, if you relax, you're doing all of these things, you're overstimulating yourself, like whatever. Um, but it turned out that that was a thing and, and I hadn't really been dealing with it or having someone like kind of help me figure out how to, you know, like work with it. Um, and then 10 years ago, I had a really bad concussion. So I actually, so I've got a brain injury, right? And, and when we talk about concussions, we don't talk about the fact that it's a brain injury. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, you know, I've, I've also go for, for physio for that to, to help out. Um, so quite often, I think probably like two or three times a year, I actually can't recognize faces. So it, it gets really bad that uh, a person that I know very well, I can't place where I know them from. And this, this actually happened with Becca one night, we were out with friends and they were dressed, you know, two of them were dressed identically and I couldn't figure out who they were. Um, so, you know, the, it's, it's been interesting kind of navigating this, this world and especially this industry, because we are really social. Um, even, even through the pandemic, I feel that it's, it's incredibly social and there is this, um, kind of the, the expectation that I will remember every person that I've met and, and prior to both the diagnosis and the concussion, I was never good at remembering people. Uh, so now <laughs> it's only gotten worse. And I think that's just trying to like navigate stuff is, is incredibly tricky. Yeah, for sure. I can relate to some of that. Um, yeah. I recently um, got a diagnosis of ASD. Um, my backstory is, and I've always been very literal, very, into having things structured, very, um, I guess, awkward, or I struggled a lot socially. Um, I've always been a selective eater. Certain food textures mess with me. Always had sensory issues with light and sound, and it might not even be the brightness or the um, volume of a sound. It could just be what the sound is and it might not be irritating, but anybody else for me. And sometimes there's certain sounds that are at a pitch that most people don't even hear them. And it drives me batshit crazy, almost like a dog, dog whistle. Yeah. But um, I have a nephew, he's six now. Um, and he is also autistic, but when he was two or three years old, my sister-in-law and my brother you know, told the family that he had been diagnosed with autism. And I personally was like, well, what does that mean? You know, what are the implications of that? What does he need? What do we need to do? 
and they start bringing up all this shit. Well, he doesn't like this food, and this fucks with him, and he and um he doesn't like loud sounds, and he doesn't like this or that. And I'm like, well, I don't like that either. It's got to be something more than that if you're gonna say yes, this disorder. I don't have it, and I <laughs> I'm like that. But um, recently, my dad and I were talking and I was like, well, he and I have so much in common. If he ever came to California, I could set up, you know, exactly what he needed, because half the shit that you say triggers him also triggers me. And my dad said verbatim, oh, you got the same shit as him. We just didn't know it back then. And that's what wow. drove me so. <laughs> to go deal with it and, and get checked out for it and you know of course he was available to talk to the people too about what I was like when I was a kid but yeah um pretty recently for me as well adulthood um one thing I think it's really hard to find somebody that will even take you or take that seriously in an adult uh, in a black person in someone who's assigned female at birth a lot of those, a lot of those characteristics about us make us go undiagnosed for so long. And so yeah. Yeah, that's kind of my backstory and kind of uh, where I'm at. Um, that, like you said, that makes beer, doing beer kind of hard or doing alcoholic beverage industry kind of hard because it's a social industry. You're gonna go in a tap room, people are gonna be blasting music. People are gonna be all in your space. Uh, there it can be crowded people have animals there's kids in there there's all these things going on and you it's kind of hard for me sometimes to center myself in that if I'm especially if I'm out of spoons for the day yeah and I think that's that's the hardest part and and you know just listening to you talk about like uh light and sound sensitivity like I also have the same thing um I'm very sensitive to how lights are so the office that I'm in has a giant light I can't handle it um you know my mom also was like yeah certain frequencies would just make you like freak out and and so like I don't know what else is you know what else I got going but um talking about being in tap rooms and having to be on and and just be able to process things there is there's almost this request of normalcy right like mm -hmm. and, and as you've said that you know being black and and being taken seriously by the medical um profession is so hard like you know i didn't i didn't get the add diagnosis until i was in my 30s and so who knows how things could have been different Right. I remember I remember working, you know, I worked in offices for a really long time and having a boss who was like, you know, that the office life is not for you. Mm -hmm. She's, you know, she's, she always said to me, your brain is too creative to be here. And I never really understood what she meant by being creative. I was like, I'm not super artistic, like I kind of, but, and now I, I realize what it was. <laughs> and it was like, I was a little too feral and a little too much to be constrained into those things and I think that that sometimes is the good part of beer that depending on where you are and of course with with my job you know I, I went from being in retail to transitioning to being into sales and then transitioning to working to my for myself and I think that working for myself made the huge difference because I can't I just I can't be that employee that is everyone else and I need to to kind of have moments because when that you know I always call it the ADD attack when it happens I'm done. I can't, I can't power through it. I can't do anything else. Mm -hmm. And and so being able to, to understand it and really to kind of try and accept it and, and, and know how to work around it. I don't know if I could do that if I worked for someone else. Yeah. And I, I struggle with that at work sometimes. The, uh, the good thing about the career I've built and the kind of jobs that I have is that you, I mostly telecommute. Um, I set my own appointments. I manage supply a part of our supply chain. So I'm telling them when I'm gonna come. If I can't make it, I'm telling them I will reschedule this with you. You know, it's not, I don't have people giving me ridiculous deadlines all the time. And I don't think I could fit in a space like that either. Like that's that's why I am on the supply chain end as opposed to the other end. Cause I've been on the other end of the business and I didn't like it. I didn't like, you know, the commitment to customers that I that I had to make. Like what if I'm 
What if my emotions are unable to be regulated today? This person gonna come in here and I'm not, you know, I may use a, a sick day. And then, right. you know, whether you do it or not, the people, you, you're gonna be judged for that. Yeah. You know, I, I, a sick day or whether you don't. Yeah. And yeah. lose your shit at the job, so. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and we'll talk about a little bit in, in, in beer. Um, a lot of things that people, my, one thing I see in this industry is that people don't treat accommodations for um, mental health. And they, we talk about mental health all the time or neurological divergence or any other disability that has been defined as such that isn't physical the same way as they treat physical disabilities. Yep. You, if they can't see it or, or verify it, it's, it's not real to them. And when you ask for accommodations, they, they don't get made. You're full of shit. You're being selfish or whatever else, you know? Yeah. You're being like super dramatic. And I think that, uh, with, with the whole notion of invisible disabilities and, you know, with part of the work that I do, I'm really trying to build that in a lot more because people forget about it. They're, they're very, if I don't see what's wrong with you, then there's nothing wrong with you. And there's so much more. And, and I think that it gets to this unfortunate situation where people don't become open about it until they either experience it themselves or it's their loved one who goes through it. And then suddenly they're like, oh yeah, the invisible disability, like now I care. And this is like the thing, right? And, and I think that we, we also are dictated and told when we have to care about these things. Mm -hmm. So here in Canada land, um, Bell, which is one of our telecom giants, does the Let's Talk Day. And it's a day to talk about your mental health issues and like how these things, you know, how your invisible disability like affects your life. And for every tweet or like or repost, we give like a nickel up to like X amount of money. And that is a day. It's a day where people care about it. And then a bunch of ex-Bell employees are like, yeah, they fired me for like having a mental breakdown. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, there's there's always this thing, but we are, we are this, this society of if I cannot see it, if I cannot touch it, if I cannot, you know, understand it fully, then it doesn't, it's not a thing. Um, and again, you know, like I said a few minutes ago about the whole thing when people joke about like, oh, I'm so ADD or I'm so OCD. And it's like, if you know what it's like to really live it, there's no way you would joke about it. I mean, I have friends with OCD who have been in like decades of therapy to get to the point where it doesn't take them an hour to leave their homes. Right right? Like it only takes them five minutes because they figured out ways to like get through it. And it's just, it's like, if you lived it for a week, you, you never joke about it again. Some of this shit is torment though, because the world is not built for us. Yeah. Like you, I mean, people think there's all of these accommodations and some, but we have so many people with our same neurotypes out there that can't get diagnosed. Because they're old and nobody wants to touch that. That means they can't get accommodations. They don't have access to resources. They can't go tell their job anything like that because they don't have the paperwork to back that up. No one's going to believe them. Yeah, and I think too that there's there's obviously um, kind of this, you, you have to have the money, right? You have to have the money. Mm -hmm. You have to have the ability to get to these things. And I'm incredibly, you know, like hashtag blessed, um, you know, Becca, Becca has, has benefits and her company takes it very seriously and, and healthcare is, is like top notch. And so, you know, I, I went back to therapy at the beginning of, of this year because I hadn't done it for years and, and I was not in a good place. And it finally was like, oh, I can do this because there's a coverage. But for so many people who just are like, I'm going to, I'm going to muddle through it. And, and in the beer industry, there's a lot of people who are just like, I'm a drink right? I have access yeah. to it. I'm just going to numb my feelings and I'm going to like try and be like everyone else and, and not, and not, you know, kind of like show that I'm different because yeah. we still just don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. I mean, and I know I almost went down a slippery slope when I was full-time in that industry. It's one of the reasons I got out. I'm like, yeah. yeah, I got some shit going on, but I don't need to be a drunk to and, if, and I, I, my family has a history of alcoholism and I'm like I I can't put you know April and other people through me dealing with something like this if I can prevent it yeah and I, and I think that that's the piece that we have to remember because there's 
you know, a lot of, a lot of those who, who drink to kind of suppress these things, like these are people who are neurodivergent or those who have those, you know, the other invisible uh, disabilities that there are no concessions made. And so it's just, if I just do this, then no one worries about it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that if, if you, you know, those who are watching, if you have friends that are neurodivergent, like ask them how they're feeling through the pandemic, they're probably doing okay uh, because we can actually control how we do things mm -hmm. because everything has become virtual. And there's, you know, it's ramping up now, but there was very, very little need to be in person and very little need to interact. I, I saw a question kind of pop up about um, tap rooms, you know, the loud music and the lights and, and how to make it more comfortable. And like, those were things I didn't have to worry about. Uh, you know, so I think that that those those are pieces that it was like they're as terrible as the pandemic was and is uh, being able to kind of create your own nesting area was fantastic. Yeah, and this is working a whole lot better for me than it would in person. I mean, I I don't know if I could do it <laughs> on a <laughs> in front of I mean, I'm sure all the people who have dialed in are lovely. If I had to stare at everyone's face, this would be a lot more difficult for me. Um, yeah, and if y'all want to use the question Q and A boxes, we can answer those questions. Get to them a little easier because some of these are comments. Some people are asking questions, and I'm trying to filter through them. So yeah, I saw that uh, there was a question about spaces and places that are especially welcoming or comfortable, uh, i.e., outdoors. That's from Laura, and and. I just thought it was me being fussy, but it turned out like, oh, that was part of the whole diagnoses. Um, so I do things that make me very, feel very safe. So I'll travel to the same places and I will stay in the same place if I can. Um, you know, I was just in Halifax recently and I stayed in the same place I stayed in Halifax four years ago, uh, you know, and, and so it's like, I try to expand and do some new things, but then it becomes a very, like, if, you know, even if I go to a restaurant, I'll use the same washroom every single time I'll use the same stall. And if I have to change, then there's kind of a little routine I go through. But uh, those those pieces of this, the same touch points over and over again, help me kind of focus what I need to do and, and make me feel a lot more comfortable. Yeah, I, I can second that the welcoming spaces that are the ones that give me a little bit more control. Um, I know April, my wife, April, she's in the audience somewhere. <laughs> she and I went to a basketball game and they had these sensory kits and, you know, they had like little shades if, you know, the lights were going to bother you, kind of like the ones you get after you get your eyes dilated. Yeah. Um, they had headphones for you if you needed to. And then they also identified areas you could go to if you um, needed a quiet space to gather yourself. Amazing. So having that, just having that available can prevent some, of, just knowing that it's there can help sometimes and that's one thing that's big that the that a tap room could could do like you have a little a quiet area hotels have quiet floors sometimes you know <clears throat> quiet hours this is a space i know i can go or where it's you know maybe the lights aren't as bright maybe there's not fluorescent lights maybe the music isn't as loud in this um in this area um and another big thing I would say about tap rooms in general, some of them have opened up kitchens in there. And um, a lot of times, once somebody opens up a kitchen, they don't want you to bring outside food. But everybody here wants to be super creative and exotic with their food that they put in their kitchen. And then you tell me I can't bring what I want to eat. I'm not going to come. I'm not going to come because you're putting something there that, you know, clearly wasn't designed for me. Not that it has to be, but, I, you know, there's not anything in there that I would I would eat. You're certainly not going to pay to eat it. So <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm probably going to go either drink somewhere else where I can order food. That was one of the things that I liked about going to breweries. I could order whatever food that I wanted and then yeah. making modifications for people who need them like if you you know if somebody doesn't want this or that don't be like well that's difficult for the chef to do it's an it's an accommodation that you yeah would yeah and I think that that's part of that's part of the problem right is that there are no accommodations and you know and I get it you open a kitchen uh because you want to be able to showcase certain things but then have simple items also available and it doesn't have to be I mean hell make it a, like a secret menu <laughs> 
and be like, you know, here are these things. And I, I just think that allowing people to have a thing that makes them feel safe and grounded means that they'll come back again. Mm-hmm. And, and those of us who have these like creature of habit tendencies will then feel safe enough to be like, okay, this is the place I can go to. And, you know, I mean, we've got, we've got a restaurant that's close by and we go all the time and it's just, it's like, I'll probably eat the same four or five things. Um, and it's, you know, and it's not that I'm a fussy eater and I won't, I won't expand it, but it's just like, these are things I know are good. I like them. They're easy. Let's go for it. Uh, and I, I think that's just kind of having those pieces where it's like, it doesn't have to be highbrow, you know, hell do a happy hour, and <laughs> like put it for three hours. Here's that thing. Those are the people who are going to show up all the time for it. Yep. Okay. We got a couple questions in the Q and a, um, so Allison and Betsy, I don't know which one of them is asking this question. I think it's Allison. Uh, yeah, I, that would be my guess also. <laughs> but it says, I love to talk about autistic slash neurodivergent folks who love interacting with others, but may do so in a way that those folks aren't used to. What are best practices for tap room staff to ensure it's a safe space for them? You want to go first? Um, I think, I mean, I, I am fairly neurotypical presenting. Um, but for me, I, I like a quiet space. I think that if I'm, if I'm going to interact with someone, it's, it's kind of a, like, give me a spot to be in because I, I think that, you know, I also have terrible hearing. So if it's super loud, then I like shut down. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that means that I'm not interacting the way that everyone else is going to, because now I'm, I'm in my head and I'm trying to figure out all of these things. And, um, you know, it's don't, it have a spot where we can, we can sit in a, in a spot where it's a little more calming. I know that everyone wants music, but don't have, you know, if you notice that I'm under the speakers and I'm starting to get a little like, wah, uh, <laughs> just be like, Hey, do you guys want to move? Do you, you know, do you want to do this? Um, it's not about making apologies for people and their behavior. It's, you know, I mean, people who are, are neurotypical can be really hella awkward too. Uh, <laughs> So I think that it's not about making concessions. It's about having options available. Yeah. And I I think as far as people who want to communicate, some people are nonverbal. I know some folks uh, use ASL by choice, not because they um, have hearing issues or are deaf. Um, But yeah, just make sure that they know that they can come to you with that stuff. Um, I know I'm a big fan, and this is going to show up differently for everybody. I know I'm a big fan of signage, and this kind of goes into uh, Jamie's questions about how did I find out about the sensory kit. There's signs. If you are willing to make these types of accommodations, make it public. Don't try to hide it. Don't make me come to you and and disclose my entire medical diagnosis or talk about everything I have that you know I might be self-conscious about it make make sure it's um it's clear that you have an area or if you know if I want to use Morse code and you know Morse code this if we 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 have ASL or we speak another language or you can do okay. Morse code or have, yeah. have signage that you can communicate that without necessarily speaking to the person. And that goes into the sensory kit thing. They told us when they sent the ticket, they said, if you need this accommodation, this is where you go to get it. When I got in the stadium, there were several signs. If you need this, this is where to get it. Here's the signs to the area if you need to to go and um, collect yourself. And then they announced it as well. So they had multiple different communications that told you that this is available to you and here's where you can go and get it so I would say the biggest thing is not necessarily trying to look for specific ways to say things but making sure that you're proactive about doing it because it's going to be it's going to be um different for everybody how they want to receive that information but it's important that you put it out there before somebody has to ask for it try to anticipate those things yeah I mean you can buy a giant jar of of earplugs at Costco for like nothing uh so it's not it's not that you have to go and spend all this mad cash to be you know sensory uh aware 
it, it's it's really about just kind of looking at options and then talking to people. If you have a regular that has disclosed to you or that, you know, you kind of see something happening, just be like, what would make your experience better? Like mm-hmm. you're a business person. You can ask the question. You're not like, hey, I think you might be neurodivergent. So like, tell me, just, just yeah. ask and say <laughs> like, you know, I noticed that if we play this music, like you get a, like you get a, uncomfortable and you leave, like, is it something about the volume? Is it the the song? Like, I mean, you can just, you ask questions. You ask people questions about everything that they're already doing within your space, right? Like, how do you like that beer? How, you know, are you comfortable? So mm-hmm. it doesn't hurt to ask the question. And if that person is just like, yeah, don't worry about it. Like it reminds me of my ex, then hey, you asked a question, but at least you tried. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like uh, I know a lot of myself and a lot of other people with ASD are extremely straightforward and communicate very directly. That's right. one symptoms that you know I'm extremely literal extremely to the point I'm not really into a whole lot of chit chat and stuff especially if I don't know you I'm not trying to have random conversations with you so if you have that question ask it straight up like she said yeah but yeah um so Laura has it looks like a couple questions are there any foods across the board that are generally more comfortable certain textures no spices etc to have on the menu on that kind of menu so I'm I'm guessing that's aligning with the brewery yeah I think I mean um so so one of the breweries that I'm actually working with um I'm I'm consulting with another accessibility expert so Julie Sachek if if you don't know her please look her up she's amazing um they have brought in things and put within the menu that if you want to ask for reading glasses or i think there's like earplugs there's larger menus and then they have done like a soft food so there's a pureed food that they do and the pureed food is actually shaped like regular food so it doesn't look like just a bowl of mush um because they want people to yeah, because yeah, they want people to, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, why are you eating that weird bowl? Yeah. Yeah. So they've they've um, partnered with a company that actually does it. I think that textures, is, it just depends. Uh, I can't handle the sound of crunching, but I mean, but sometimes I'll do it. Like I bought, you know, I bought a bag of Fritos lately, like, because I haven't had them forever. Um, but then some days I'm not okay with it. So it really depends. But I think that some of that goes back to uh, the creature of habit stuff. So I already know that like these foods are totally cool for me and these ones are like sometimes okay and these ones are no go. I think most people will know um, what you wanna be able to do is give people options. And so again, in Canada, there are companies that do pureed food that actually um, produce them in a way that look that look like real food. Yeah, yeah and I, for me, I mine is some timey like that too. Sometimes I can tolerate things and some days it's just not, it depends on how many spoons I got. Um, <laughs> but like, I'm, I'm a person who gags when I brush my teeth in the morning. I gag mm-hmm. when that's in my mouth. So it, anything, anything can be a trigger. I'm still learning some of those now. But for me, I don't like wet, crunchy stuff like celery oh, and carrot no. and apples but who likes celery come on now i don't know (laughs) i don't know well april doesn't cook with it she doesn't fuck with celery that much unless she's making gumbo but um yeah but like stuff like that and like if it's in april makes this accommodation for me at home like if she needs to cook with those veg like bell peppers and stuff like the onions she knows that I'm not going to sit and eat chunks of that. So she'll food process is so small that it's in it. Like you said, then the puree, puree thing. So it's in there. It gives the food its flavor and it's, um, but it, you know, it doesn't fuck with me as far as its texture <laughs> is concerned. Yeah. And I, I don't like, unless it's like ice cream, like cold entree, mushy stuff. I can't eat that as like a, a meal. Unless it's right. dessert, I can't do it. Like pasta, salad, anything served cold like that, I, I can't do it. But yeah, it. I think having things that are customizable is better. A lot of people buy pre-assembled things. Like if somebody right. doesn't want like a bunch of cheese slime on the top of their, they have an option to remove that, you know? Yeah, and I, and I think that, that some of that is just kind of the basics, right? Like, so again, we're not asking for people to go and revamp their menus and make it that 
it's you know it's everything's kind of soft uh <laughs> I, think, I think i think it should be that you you either have kind of that not so secret secret menu uh where there are those little extra pieces or you have a thing that you can customize and like again you're gonna have things on your menu where you're like yo we can't we can't do substitutions on it that's fine mm -hmm. but just give people who need options something within that where there is an option yep exactly april says she loves us April. Um, <laughs> do you often carry earplugs, sunglasses, and such to help navigate uncomfortable situations or simply prefer to avoid those at all costs? For me personally, like I, if I'm with somebody, I've usually resolved that I'm going to you know, try to hold my shit together because I'm obviously there to interact with that person if i'm by myself nine times out of ten you will see me with noise canceling headphones on but everybody cannot afford noise canceling headphones those are extremely expensive and so um yeah i in the sunglasses i don't i don't wear them too much because i my sensory issue is more like the type of light as opposed to um how bright it is but yeah <laughs> I do carry headphones anywhere I would go. Um, these are transitions. So the second that I go outside, they just change over. So I'm I'm not too bad about that. Uh, for me, I just bought loop earplugs, which again, like they're kind of pricey. I think they're like 25, 30 bucks a pair, but they do not completely take out all the noise. They just dull it. Uh, so sometimes like that's what I need. I just need like to cut the edge off something. So that's what I have. Uh, and then I have like the little Christmas tree style earplugs, which I also use. Uh, I, was, I also travel with those all the time, but I'm not too, too bad uh, because again, where have I gone in the last 19 <laughs> months? Uh, I've just started traveling again and I am definitely like a earphones and like just listening to stuff. And again, creature habits so i'm listening to like the same kind of things over and over again because that's what brings me comfort and joy yep for sure no, for sure yeah. all right so i mean now that we have you know sometimes you definitely go in that q a box if y'all got more questions for sure um ren what do you think about like employing people in this business who might be neurologically diver divergent? What do you think folks can do for people who, for you know, to promote neurodiversity in their business, on the business end of it? I think they need to do their homework because a lot of, a lot of breweries and a lot of, you know, beer adjacent companies are always like, we want diversity. And, and I think that people think about diversity in terms of what you can see, right? So again, you can tell that we're your diversity. Uh, but if you're going to do it, do your homework and understand that not all of your diversity comes from how someone looks, uh, that, you know, neurodivergence, ask questions like, what do you need? Do you need to be here? Because again, pandemic work is so different. Mm -hmm. So it can be that like, you know what, you're going to be crunching numbers. Or you're going to be making phone calls. You can do it at home. We can set you up with the software. Um, and again, that these aren't things that you're going to be spending a million dollars to make happen because you're probably already doing it in some capacity. So it's, it's about talking to that person and understanding to a degree, because you're not always going to understand it. Um, but you don't, you don't have to use it as an advertising piece. Uh, you know, I've got, I've got friends who are on the spectrum. They're fully within the spectrum. They've got amazing jobs and you would never know until they told you. And I think that, you know, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, all of these folks working for these places, their, their companies make the concessions for them. Uh, I think that we, we ask people, what kind of work environment do you want to be in anyways? So if we're going to ask that and someone discloses or, or kind of alludes to it, like, you can you can make these things work out in a way that just, just makes sense. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I would I would echo all of that to be to be honest. Like I, the thing about it is the accommodation that most people aren't gonna gonna lie about having this type of disability. They're just not going to. Nobody the 
the risk of, of, of lying and being labeled is the, well outweighs any reward you would get from an accommodation that you would need because there's going to be a stigma attached to it whether you intend for there to be or not that's just where we are right now as a society yeah so when people tell you that I would say that you you should believe them I would say don't go you know digging into people's diagnosis or trying to make your own judgment about how autistic somebody is or how far you know along on the spectrum someone is because that's a inappropriate and and b i think is a bit demeaning yeah and i also think like do your homework and and understand that you know if someone tells you they're autistic it's not gonna be one style because it is such a huge range that it goes from you know nonverbal to like you ain't gonna think anything's wrong with, wrong with me uh, which you know the same thing with with ADD and ADHD and and all you know there's there's so many different pieces where it's like none like no two people are gonna present the same way right and and everyone's gonna have that piece that like this is this is my jam and this is the thing I really love working on which guess what that's what most people do right like people are you know someone's like I really love numbers and I'm like numbers are you kidding me <laughs> uh, like so I think it's it's really about just talking about that person's strengths but also understanding that if they have a day where they're just like yo I can't understanding okay if you can't then how do we make this work because a business is a business because hey it was capitalism all along but you're not going to fire them the, the first time that they're just like I can't people today yeah, and that's insane because I mean, I don't know. I hate to I hate to say this, but I'm gonna say it because it's my truth. But <laughs> but I mean, and not that everybody's gonna be this way, and not that people who aren't this way don't deserve their accommodations or aren't entitled to the same respect, but I just left the company for other reasons that had unlimited PTO and unlimited sick time. I took that shit, you know, whenever I needed to. And guess what? I still outperformed everybody on the team. Yeah. Still, you don't know what you're going to get. Like you, you might be inhibiting somebody's productivity. Not that that's what you should judge people on, but if that's what you want, the best thing to do is accommodate them. Yeah. And I, and I think that we have to remember that it's not about making like extra concessions. You should be treating your staff like gold anyway. Right. And if you're not like, maybe this isn't the business for you. And I think that, Maybe. understanding yeah but I also but I also think that there is this uh the shift especially within the alcohol industry you know like so many of my friends who sell beer don't drink it anymore mm -hmm. and you know for whatever reason like who cares it's none of our business and and I think if we make concessions for that you can make concessions for anything like yep. I'm sorry a beer rep who doesn't drink beer yet yeah. crushes their their goals every quarter like right that's, <laughs> but you're going to give, you're going to give me a hard time because I spent an hour, like basically counting the spots on the wall, but then for the next seven hours, I like crushed everything I was supposed to do. Like mm -hmm. if within a day you hit targets or within a week, you hit the targets that are set for the week. It doesn't matter what I did in between to get there. Right. If I hit my targets, I hit my targets. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, and again, remembering that not everyone presents the same way. Not all black people look the same way. Not all gay people act the same way. Like, so why are you thinking that neurodivergent people are going to be all the same and it's going to be textbook? Right. And it, yeah, everybody presents differently. And those other things that you're mentioning, people being uh, the queer or trans or, or black or some other ethnicity, that's going to show up differently. Those things are going to play into how their neurological divergence shows up because basically like the, the criteria was mostly focused in the past on white boys that's how yeah. some of the rest of us go undiagnosed for so long yeah but yeah oh, we got a couple more questions so kelly asks would you share how you plan your breaks throughout your day and how you let your coworkers, boss know you need a break if something sudden comes up that really throws you for a loop i am my own boss <laughs> and my boss is a jerk. Uh, <laughs> I think I, and, and I'm really, I'm really lucky that way because I, you know, I, I do have a workaholic tendency, but if I can't, I can't. And I have gotten to the point where when I, when I started this, I was very like, just power through it. 
Mm-hmm. And, and as time has gone, it's like, if I power through it, I don't give people the best of me. And I am also the product, right? So it's like that double whammy. Um, I'm, I, I have canceled meetings because I'm just like, I can't. Um, I won't necessarily tell people why. I might just be like, oh shit, I double booked it. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, can we do it another day? Um, you know, because again, I'm not necessarily going to be honest because I might not be able to vocalize what it is that's wrong. It might just be like, everything shut down. I don't know how to do it. Um, so, but I'm also very, and I think part of the difference is that I'm very open about me and what makes me me. So if, if I say to someone, I can't do it, they're like, oh, oh shit. Okay. It's something big. Like we'll, we'll get back to you and we'll like redo it. But I just, I don't, um, I don't punish myself for having to take a break and, you know, through the day I'll do, I'll do what I got to do. I'm also a, like, I don't usually start work before 10 or 11 because I want to go later in the day because as the day goes on, I feel more powered and, and, you know, like my batteries have recharged. Uh, so yeah, I just, I just try to be really, really open with myself, but also open with my clients and, and those who I may potentially work with. I don't know. For me, I, I'm the opposite of, of sis over here. Good thing we're in two different time zones. That's why it works. <laughs> I'd be texting Ren at like, you know, the eight and nine o'clock my time and she still be up. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm texting her in the middle of the night and she's hitting it right back. I'm like She's not asleep. <laughs> but I'm a morning person. So being starting early is something that you know I communicate to you know on the front end that I need to do because usually I'm the only person starting to work and it gives me time to myself in the morning that nobody else no one's going to email me no one's going to bother me no one's going to be doing any of that at 6 a.m it'll just be me or 5 30 it's just me and I can have a chance to just center myself as far as breaks um I try to, I always try to take my lunch now. I haven't been really good about that. That's something I'm um, learning to do is take breaks from work. Um, I have an Apple watch, which again, you know, that's my privilege. Everybody can't afford that, but it tells me when I need to stand up and I'm so rigid about that. I actually do get up and, and move because if I didn't have those reminders and stuff, if I didn't have the watch, I would probably set a reminder in um, Outlook to get up because I will sit there until I, if a task takes 12 hours, I will sit down 12 hours in a row and not eat anything, not get up, not go to the bathroom, don't drink anything. And I mean, I know this irritates April sometimes because she's trying to do stuff or cook or you, know, you said, you let me just finish this. Give me five more minutes and then it's four hours. And, but um, usually my employers have been pretty flexible about that. When I got into this industry, as far as, you know, my engineering job and day job, my first uh, manager, we were in this like all day tiger team event. All these people have flown in like these high level bosses and my boss. And we went to visit one of the suppliers and I had a meltdown and just was in tears. This woman took me into the little bench in the bathroom and sat there until I, she, you know, calmed me down. And she was like, if you feel like this again, take the day off. You don't have to explain this. If you're having problems like this, take the day off. Don't come in here. You don't need to come in here. Like, don't do this to yourself. And it's not productive for anybody. You don't have to come. And we'll, you know, I'll talk to whoever I need to about what you can't do or what, you know, where you won't be. So that was the first time that I really, you know, saw myself as human at work. And it took somebody else telling me that what, you know, what the hell are you doing? But I think it's going to be hard for, it's harder for people to communicate things like this to their managers, if the manager hasn't both said and demonstrated that this is acceptable. Yeah, I, and I think that always makes it so hard and so tricky because it's it's not about declaring it acceptable. It's, this is a piece of humanity, 
mm. that, that we're looking at. And I think that if someone has a track record where they show you that they can be productive, let them be productive in the ways that work for them. Um, you know, if, if it means that they, they work from 5.30 till 2, you know, uh, then that's what they do because guess what? The work gets done. And for sales reps, I mean, a lot of, you know, that was, that was part of the appeal for me. It's because I didn't have to be out until 11.30 or 12.00. Uh, in in the afternoon and then I could work until eight at night and I would still as Tony can attest I'd still be awake after that which meant I could get my paperwork done and so if if through the week I suddenly was like hey um, I need this half an hour or this half day or I need a whole day it's okay because I knew that the next day I'd be able to pick it up mm -hmm. yeah and I this actually is a segue into another question is about teams. Um, so how would you suggest navigating accommodation from an HR standpoint? Ugh, I will let Rin talk Oof. about that. In terms, of, <laughs> in terms of different guidelines is needed and communicating that with the rest of the staff. Don't wanna put you on the spot, but everyone else needs to know how to help and be better team members. Yeah, I think that it is not HR's responsibility to be like, hey, you have a neurodivergent uh, team member. I think that it needs to be behind the scenes that if that neurodivergent team member uh, within whatever industry is like, hey, hey, here's my jam, it's up to them to say something. And it's it's always up to us to say something to HR. And it's not about giving your full life story. It's just, I, you know, maybe I can't handle the the lights, you know, fluorescent lights were the bane of my my life for all the years I worked in in offices. So maybe it's like, can I be put in a corner where if the light blows out, they don't replace it? Um, or, you know, I want to work later or I want to work earlier. Like, can that be accommodated? That's between that person and HR. If they have an issue with the team, then that's, you handle that through your usual management um, channels, but it is not about disclosing what that person's concessions are or their needs are or their issues because it's the same thing for anyone mm -hmm. if someone needs some extra time off you're not going to be like hey hr tell the rest of the team why i'm taking the time so i think you have to kind of look at it in in terms of, of how you would treat a staff normally and i think the problem with breweries is that a lot don't have hr and and that is the piece that needs to be adjusted and that is either a third-party hr or um you know take a look at, at actually implementing it uh, a brewery owner should never be HR that's I don't care if you studied it I don't care if you have a degree in it I don't care if you have a master's in HR uh, you cannot own a, a place and be HR it's automatically a conflict of interest and I think that if someone comes to you and says I am neurodivergent and I need to make a plan it is not up to the owner slash HR that's when you get third party and that's when you have them deal with the best way to to deal with with those needs because otherwise it's it, how you make people feel safe yeah and i mean i i kind of get the question about the team because the people are shitty um like people are shitty like, regardless why, why is this person getting this extra you know time off and i'm gonna report this and you're being on i could see that happening in a heartbeat you know in a because you know how people are, it, not even just with this, even if, you know, there's things that are being put in place for diversity in other areas or equity you know, to make things more equitable. As soon as a white man doesn't get that, he you're discriminated against him. So like, I can see this being something that a teammate says, I didn't get this, or you wouldn't give me this concession or that concession. And I think it's, you have to be clear up front when with teams when you bring people in saying you know we make accommodations for folks who who need them it's not your business or anyone else's yeah. business and before some before you even need to make an accommodation you might not even have a team member yet if we yeah, have but I also I, and i think that with, with that that's about your code of conduct and that's about your values and those are things that have to be in writing that's yes. that's up to you put it in writing because then it's it's solid and if someone's like but i have a problem with it you can be like here it is and this is what you saw when you started working here and if we did it later on then you still have a copy of it and you had to sign off on it yep. because also not your business that person doesn't report to you so who cares 
you know what, a, a lot of the people who may need a little bit of extra uh, wiggle room probably doing a better job than you are. So like, maybe don't draw attention to yourself. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Laura says, or maybe specific people need to know specific things. Like the person who does scheduling might know that loud music nights are not good for a particular staff member. Yeah. But I think that that's the, the conversation, right? So you've created your code of conduct. You're saying, you know, and, and I mean, it's code of conduct, but it's also your, your handbook and the, like the employee concessions. It's in there. There's always stuff in there about time off and whatever. But that is not up to the team member to tell the person who does the scheduling. That's up to if there's HR or if there's a manager who is aware of the situation, it's up to them. And if they're not going to do it, guess what? That person's not going to stay. So to, be clear, to be clear, I think the question is more that, you know, this person needs this information so they don't play the music that loud when, you know, ex customer or such and such a staff member is in the area. And I think that, that the whole thing with with staff is that you're you're already asking people kind of what it is. And and if you're in a place where it can't be avoided, then that's not the job for that person. Right. I mean, it's you already have kind of these rules and regulations in place for like a pregnant coworker, a per, you know, you have like a grief policy, you have all these other policies. So it's like, you're throwing in one more policy that you will probably not enact all that often. So this isn't that, you know, every time you get one of us showing up, we're going to use all your policies. We might never, we might never disclose because it never becomes an issue because we know, you know, how to, how to deal with it or how to like do what we got to do. Um, so I, you know, I don't want people thinking that like, if I make a policy, it's going to get used every other day. No one's going to do that because you don't, I mean, it's hard to ask for the accommodation in the first place. You're not going to ask for seven of them that you don't need. Yeah. But yeah, as far as the, from my end, as far as the loud music, I think the person, um, like, dude, you might not want to schedule that person when you have a live band or in somewhere where they got to interact with that, but as far as you just playing music in the tap room, that person should be empowered power to turn that music down if they need to themselves. Or change it to something that they that comforts them. Yeah. I they, mean, music music doesn't have to be hella loud during the day. No, oh, you meant a live band. Okay. <laughs> I meant a live band. Yeah, that person probably shouldn't be scheduled when you have live music. Um, and you want the person doing the scheduling to be in a position where they would have access to that information. It shouldn't be random staff member X who's not a manager or in, in you know, nowhere in any uh, place of authority or who wouldn't already have that information disclosed to them. That person shouldn't be scheduled. My colleagues don't schedule my shifts for me. So yeah. that probably answer the manager should already know that information yep. okay and so what else Rand? what else you want to know oh man um the the comments were great too is kind of taking a look through a what was in there yeah and i you know what but i think i think that it's <laughs> <laughs> I just I love it I, again like thanks you know thanks to everyone who's who's shown up live and, and everyone who's going to tune in later I think that this is a piece that we forget about when we have the diversity conversations uh we need to start talking about invisible you know invisible uh, disabilities and how we deal with it and how we address it and that understand that this is not a thing that if you do not experience it that you're like oh it's going to take up all of my time to like try and figure it out it's not by, by the time you meet anyone who is neurodivergent or has anything along that line, they've been dealing with it for a very long time and have already started to figure out what they need and what they don't need and what they would like that, you know, whether they get it or not. Um, and, and it's, it's not the only reason that you, you hire someone it's, you know, you also don't hire someone just based on the color of their skin to be like, this was my check mark. Um, and, and so really, if you have questions about it, do some homework. And, you know, talk to those who are willing to talk to you, talk to the experts, follow, follow accounts where that information is, is made available. And if you get it wrong, it's like most things, like learn from it and, and try and, and, you know, uh, retool it and see if you can, you can make it a little better. Yeah, um, I would, I would say hashtag actually autistic 
um, is a good one yeah. on Twitter where you probably can find a lot of people talking to each other and just sharing their experiences with how, you know, the world in general in different situations. And it was also a place where I found um, some comfort that it wasn't, I wasn't just a, a weirdo. Yeah. So, and, you know, there's more people who deal with these same things and need the same accommodations. And so, um, yeah, there's that, you know, aut autistic women and non-binary network, autistic um, POC fund are good accounts to follow. Um, I think it's called Spoonie Uni or something like that. <laughs> it's a good, that's a good account that has a lot of discussion about disability and accommodations. And they, they do talk about neurological divergence. One thing I do appreciate about um, autistic women and non-binary network is it's, it speaks to it in an intersectional way. Of course, you're already talking about some marginalized genders in there and then um they they talk about race too so um because i know a lot of us you know especially us who are black kids if you have meltdowns or anything people just say oh you your daughter is bad or your, your child is bad your yeah. son is bad <laughs> you need to get control of that situation or you why you don't beat them yeah so <laughs> but it we, you know, go so long without the benefit of the doubt that there might be neurological issues or other mental health issues that need to be addressed. Um, so I would say that you want to be mindful of that when you engage with people because they're probably going to be dealing with a lot more than just their neurological divergence. They are going to be marginalized in a lot of other different ways a lot of people i know we both are <laughs> yeah yeah but uh i think you know and, and also if you're looking for more just like do some shout outs and ask people like who are you following and what's your favorite um uh, these people can tell you <laughs> okay um how do y'all deal with people that want you to be the spokesperson asking you 10 million questions like we're doing it now Tell them we, we're not speaking for everybody. And how many times have you had heard us say on here that not everyone's going to be the same? This is not going to show up the same way or everybody's not going to present the same way. That's how we deal with that. Um, yeah. If you meet a person with autism, you've met one person with autism and the next person is going to tell you something else, especially with this being a spectrum disorder. You might meet somebody on one end and you might be, you know, meet another person that's on the completely other end. You're going to meet people in the middle. Some people might have some of the same symptoms. Some people might have a totally different set of symptoms. And some people might have, you know, high sensory thresholds that are way higher than others. And some people might have a low threshold for sensory input. So it's different for everybody. And I think you got to be, be mindful of that. And that's how I would deal with it. I don't know if Rin has. Yeah, no, I, I think it's the same thing because it's, you know, we do, we do it with people of color and we do it with black people and we do it with like the indigenous community and we do, you know, like, and it's always like, I pick you. And it's like, don't, everyone's, everyone's experiences are so different. Um, it, it's, you, you just have to remember it and, and be super open to it and understand that everyone deals with it differently and not everyone embraces it. And, you know, I mean, both Tony and I have said throughout the course of this, like we came to the awareness much later in, in life. So it's not like I knew that this is what it was when I was like 15, like <laughs> I was in my thirties uh, and, and, you know, and like shit wasn't going well. And that's how I found out. So also, you know, you have to understand that the person who talks about it might be talking about it to work through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah best thing you can do for somebody is listen and support. I know uh, Ren is that to me. My wife is neurotypical and she's that for me. I mean, I get more accommodations made by her than anybody. She is um, really carrying the brunt of the accommodations, not my job. I mean, in the, the more accommodations she makes at home, the more spoons I have to actually deal with my job. So yeah. if you have people in your personal life who have neurological divergence one thing you can do is just make accommodations in your time with them the environment you spend time with them in 
and that'll probably help them have extra spoons to deal with the world who's not going to be so approachable yeah okay where will this be posted for others to find it that's a great question um like i said i'm a co-owner and co-founder some shit like that april and i founded and owned this together <laughs> of black and soul um it's black spelled with a q so it's b-l-a-q and soul it'll be on our um youtube a channel so google us on youtube or on well, google us and you will find our youtube channel um i'll also tweet out a link you can find us on at the blaq a n d s o u l on twitter and instagram and you know you can find the link tree there that has our youtube and website and all the stuff that we talk about and spoiler alert there'll probably be some writing about neurological divergence there soon so go check that out but um yeah ren uh you got any clothes where can people find you if you want them to find you <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you can find me at beer underscore diversity on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I'm really just tired and, and cranky on Twitter. Instagram's a lot more fun. And Facebook, I think it's just beer.diversity. I'm not sure. I don't really pay attention to it. I'm also on LinkedIn, but don't bother because I don't care about it. And uh, I'm just I'm kind of around. So if you want to check out my website, it is beer-diversity.com. And that has a bunch of spots that I've been in and things that are coming up and, and just kind of like the stuff that I'm, I'm up to uh, in my world. And so, yeah, find me there. Okay. Yeah. So we, that is our time. I know people have their evenings to get to, their dinner to get to. I know I get cranky when I don't get my dinner when I'm supposed to get it. Uh, but I thank everybody for joining us. I appreciate you giving us some of your time to, you know, listen to what we have to say. Thank you so much, sis Ren, for um, coming and being with me on this. Um, it nice. makes it easier for me to do this. You bring me comfort. Um, and having you as a friend, as a sister brings me joy. So I appreciate you joining me on this. We'll see you this weekend on our panel yes. at the Chicago Beer Summit. Look that up. Sunday. It'll be on Sunday. Get a ticket for Sunday if you want to see the two of us again. We'll be talking about some other stuff, but still intersectionally. But I'm going to shut it down here. Um, probably text Ren a little later. And we will have this up on the website in a couple of weeks. So take care, everybody. Sweet. Thanks, friends. It's been awesome. <laughs>